And today we are here, sadly in a sense, to talk about and remember of a man who is beloved by everyone in the Philadelphia marketplace and around the world. Uh, but we are here in a celebratory sense. We're here basically to celebrate a life well lived, a life that has touched thousands and thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people over the years over the 39 years that he was the broadcaster for the Philadelphia Phillies. And Harry Callis is being remembered by people close to him, friends, relatives, and uh, all some fans who basically uh, just enjoy his work over the many, many years. He was a tremendous person, as you've all been meeting, I'm sure, and those of you who had the pleasure of meeting him or being in his company. You know that he was a guy who traveled with kings but had that common man touch. No matter who he met, you got the feeling that you knew him for years. And he was with you, stayed with you, was a good, kind, gentle soul in so many ways and yet a phenomenal talent. And for all of those reasons, we are here today paying tribute to Harry Callis, who left us much too soon. Now on the telephone, we have our first guest of honor. We have several guests we'll be talking to today, and we'll be introducing them so you can hear their thoughts about the man that we're paying honor to today, Mr. Harry Kaus. And one of the guys that goes way back with Harry Kaus, as a matter of fact, one, and I, I would imagine some people know this, but a lot of people are not fully aware that one of the most famous phrases that Harry has used for years and years, the out of here phrase, originally came from our first guest of honor. I'm talking about a gentleman who was a phenomenal player. They said basically that he had uh, fast feet, nice soft hands. He was an incredible person who was able to do so much in baseball. As a player, he played for the Phillies from 70 to 81. And he also played for the Cubs and the Mets in later years. He managed the Padres, and then of course, as you know, married, man, managed the Phillies and was married to the Phillies for several years from 01 to 04. He is now third base coach for the Dodgers, was third base coach for the Yankees, and uh, basically has been just a phenomenal person. Five times All-Star, 74 through 79. A tremendous career in, uh, as a player, and just as we said, fast feet, strong arms, soft hands, and unlimited determination. He was fiery at shortstop. Has the record for playing 2,222 games at that position. He held the record for a while in the major leagues. And right now we have him on the telephone. Larry Bowl, first of all, thank you for calling and thank you for being with us. And you guys are having a phenomenal year out there, the LA Dodgers. How's everything going? Everything's going good. Uh, we're playing very well. And, uh, we had a nice series of the Phillies. Uh, we played four games out here in 1 2 and 2 and 1 2. We had a very good team. Yeah, well, you were, in, yeah, yeah, you were in town, of course, and then uh, the Phillies came to visit you out there. You're still the fiery person there at third base. Well, I, I have a lot of enthusiasm for the team. Uh, I always said when that, that leaves them it's time to quit the game, but I still like going to the ballpark every day and uh, going out on the field and competing with the other team. It, it's got to be a labor of love for you. Yeah, definitely. It took my whole life. Uh, you know, uh, Philly's still my home. I still live there in the wintertime, so hmm. it's good. If, if I could draw it out on a map or anything, it's been a great career, and I'm very happy with the way it turned out. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, I mentioned just a few moments ago, which you probably heard, that uh, you were the person responsible for giving Harry Callis a phrase that is in everybody's mind, even today, you know, uh, after he's gone. Uh, tell us how that basically came about. It was a batting practice, wasn't it? It was a 
back practice and it was a spring training and uh, Ben was just yeah, the hitter. And he had hit a few balls over the fence and on um, one of them I went, that ball out of here. And he had to sort of look at me and he said, that's kind of how you talk to him. Obviously the way it turned out, uh, the way Eric said it had a lot more meaning than the way I said it. Every time I saw Harry after I got Billy, he would thank me for that phrase. I said, hey, Harry, you're the guy that made this place. So he was a great human being. He was great to be around. And uh, I think people are going to realize how much he's going to be missed uh, once, once he had passed away. But uh, this guy did everything in the community. Um, went out during the wintertime, did charity work. He's going to be uh, very good to be in Philadelphia area. Yeah, he definitely will be missed. But you know, it uh, for him was a, a lifetime enjoyment. And you know, when all of us have to go, if we can go sitting in a chair where you spent most of your life doing something enjoyable like he did, I mean, he literally, the only thing better would be he was calling a home run, say, out of here, and then left us at that specified moment. But to, to die, where you work, where you do your most enjoyable work of life is a blessing of sorts. Oh, there's no question about that. Uh, if you could, uh, if you can script the way you want to pass away, I think uh, Harry did it the right way. He lived and died at baseball, especially in the Philadelphia Phillies. He died at the ballpark. And uh, the one thing that uh, you look back on, I'm just glad that Harry got to call the World Series. When we won in 80, the uh, network wouldn't allow the yeah. local broadcasters to broadcast. So he got that opportunity last year with the World Series. And I'm sure that uh, to this day he had a smile on his face. He was quite a man, and we all miss him, and we're all talking about him today. And I want to thank you very much for being on the phone with us, taking some time out for your busy day. And I just want to wish you the very best of luck, uh, except for the Phillies. We hope that the Dodgers do a great season this year. Okay? Thank you very much, Larry. say we want you to come in second because the Phillies have to come in first. At, at any rate, Larry, I'm so happy that you were with us today and glad that you're enjoying your activity there in L.A. We continue, and all of our people here, we have a set of relatives, friends, and people who worked in one way or another with Harry over the years. Our first guest uh, live here is a sports anchor for NBC, NBC 10. He earned several Mid-Atlantic Emmy nominations. He won an Emmy for Outstanding Individual Achievement for Sports Reporting. He has also been here covering the Eagles at the Super Bowl, the Phillies in the World Series, and the NFL Hall of Fame game. He grew up a stone's throw away from us in Wallingford, Pennsylvania. So he had been here in the area, went to Strath Haven High School, and was graduated from Temple University. He resides in Montgomery County, and he's covered uh, the Phillies and Harry Callis over the years. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome John Clark. Yeah. It's a little tough to follow Larry Moa, but uh, I'm going to give it a try. And, and first of all, it's an honor to be here and be invited to speak in front of so many local broadcasting legends. Uh, a lot of you that I uh, grew up watching here in Philadelphia, and a couple of people have asked, and it would be an honor, but just to set the record straight, I am not Herb Clark's son. <laughs> just to set the record straight. He has an E on the end of his name, I have no E, even though my station has spelled my name with an E several times. <laughs> Guess I'm not that important at Channel 10. Uh, but it is an honor to be here, and I probably would not be standing here as a sports anchor in my hometown, which became my dream job, if it wasn't for Harry Callis. I wanted to get into this business of sports broadcasting because of Harry Callis. And I can remember being a little kid when my parents wouldn't let me stay up and watch the games on TV. I would be up in my room like a lot of people with the radio snugged under my covers, listening to Harry and Whitey, and it was something so special about those guys. I mean, we talk about Philadelphia being so provincial, and we only love people who are from here, but we're talking about two guys from, I believe, Illinois and Nebraska, and we look at them as ours, as Philadelphians. That's, that's the way we think of them. 
And when I when I hear them, uh, you know, Harry would say to Whitey, he'd say, uh, "Hey, Whitey, we gotta thank Dolores in Northampton for these delicious chocolate chip cookies." <laughs> and Whitey would say, "Don't forget about the peanut butter morsels." <laughs> there was just something about these guys. It was so special, and their voices, their presentation. Uh, it's the reason why I wanted to become a sports broadcaster. Uh, and for a guy like Harry Callis, who may have the most well-known voice in this city's history, and also around the country. You know, I, I found it fascinating. Uh, the day Harry died, I was talking to Shane Victorino for a story we were doing, and Shane said growing up in Hawaii, he would hear Harry's voice with NFL films and NFL films work. And when I went uh, to cover the Eagles in the 2001 NFC Championship game in St. Louis, I went up to the Arch to see the Arch. Now they have Jack Buck, one of the most legendary broadcasters in the United States. And it was a St. Louis icon. icon. Now, I go into the Arch, and whose voice is welcoming you to the St. Louis Arch? It's Harry Powell's voice. It, it was amazing. And one of the greatest things to me you, you meet a lot of athletes and people in this business, and not a lot of them, I wouldn't say not a lot of them, but not all of them are the same as they appear. Harry Callis was the exact same person in person as he was on the radio. And you're a little nervous meeting some people. Um, Harry Callis made you feel like you were the important person. He had an amazing gift. And I. it is hard in Philadelphia to not hear people say something bad about somebody. But I have never, ever, ever heard anybody say anything bad about Harry Callis. And you know how many times he was asked to do the cell phone recordings, the voicemail messages? And he did them all. He never turned anybody down. And so to me, Harry Callis is one of our greatest Philadelphia treasures. And, and to me, uh, I love Harry Callis. And he's the reason why I wanted to become a sports broadcaster. Uh, so God bless Harry Callis, and thank you uh, for all the years that we had with him in Philadelphia. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. John Clark, our MVP, and thank you very much. You know, so many people grew up listening to Harry, and uh, luckily some people who admired him uh, followed in his footsteps like you did. And we have so many people that we've talked to over the last month or so saying that they grew up listening to him and they wanted to become a broadcaster, a sports broadcaster because of Harry. And Harry obviously was the voice of the Phillies, but he was also the voice of NFL films. And he did a great job as far as getting that activity as well. We'll talk more about that later on. But right now, we have a personal friend who's been a friend of Harry's for over 20 years, about 23 years or so. Uh, again, from the area, grew up as a singer, uh, now became a singer band leader, actually was on Dancing On Air as the host. Mike Nice's Dancing On Air was on TV, and our next guest was the first host of that, that TV show, Dancing On Air. He also was one of the showstoppers. You talked about Al Alberts. Uh, he was one of the showstoppers on the Al Alberts Showcase for many, many years. He was also on the Ted Mack amateur hour, this guy was all over, and he was a young man. It sounds like he's 110 years old, but maybe he's a, a young man, very, very active, plays down at the casinos at the Taj Mahal, at Caesars and at Valleys with his band, and of course as a, as a solo singer. So he's done it all. He also has a, a brand new CD out. He's had several CDs, one on Anthony Newley, but the newest one right now, and maybe we can get him to do a, a I know there's a lot of good invitations, uh, one of uh, the person that he's uh, giving a tribute to in his CD. He does a Bruce on Bennett CD, all the wonderful songs of Tony Bennett. I'm talking about a great guy from the Delaware Valley, all of you, actually many of you might know him, might have seen him in person, entertaining, and as a friend of Harry Callis, he's joining us today, Eddie Bruce, ladies and gentlemen. Actually, when I first got the call from the legendary uh, Bill Weber to uh, be here today, I, uh, 
I, of course, immediately thought, well, the broadcast pioneers were finally coming to their senses and honoring my important contribution as the host of Dancing on Air, the legendary show that Mike Nice and I did. Um, apparently, that's not the case. <laughs> And actually, uh, Al Alberts got it. Uh, I was on Al's very first show, which was done on Channel 48. I was 12 years old. It was a one-hour show. It took us 12 hours to tape the show. <laughs> Nobody knew what they were doing. I was a very opinionated 12-year-old, and I said, this will never last. <laughs> 25 years later, Al retired to Florida, and again, I was wrong. Thank you, seriously, for this honor. Um, Thank you for inviting me to speak about my friendship with Harry. There are many people, I'm sure, many in this room who knew him better than I did. But uh, if you were among the people honored to call Harry Callis your friend, it didn't really matter how long you knew him. Uh, he was your friend. Or as he would say, your pal. Hey, pal. Harry's death affected all of us who knew him very deeply. But my first reaction was not as a friend. My first reaction was as a fan, because I was a fan much longer than we were friends. Uh, when I grew up as a kid in this town, the Phillies had never won anything. And uh, in 1971, this guy came to town, and I, and I kind of I liked his work. You know, he had replaced an icon who's here with us today. And I thought, wow, good voice, nice guy, I'll enjoy that. And uh, didn't take much notice, actually. Until the September day in 1976. And on that day, the Phillies clinched their very first division. And as a lifelong fan, I was standing there in front of the TV, and I had tears streaming down my face. And I looked up at the television, and there was Harry Callis, here only five years, with tears streaming down his face. And I knew in that moment that he got it. He was one of us. He knew what it meant for me to see the Phillies become a winning team. And uh, I was looking at Callis. His broadcast always screamed to me, I get it. I know who you, you guys are. I'm one of you. Then when I got the job at Channel 17 as the host of Dancing on Air, I met him. Uh, they were, as they are now, the Philly station. And I immediately finagled access to the broadcast booth as soon as I could. He got a press pass, and I used to go every day after the show and sit with Whitey and Harry in the booth and hang out with them as much as I could. And then I played the, uh, my band and I played the Channel 17 Christmas party, the first holiday party, the year I did dance and all there. And it was in this very room. And uh, Harry and Woody were sitting right at that corner table. And I was just such a fan and so excited. And at the end of the night, Harry got up, came up to the bandstand, and did what he loved to do, which was to sing. And at the end of a long party, it was just in those years good enough for Harry to be able to stand up, actually. And, uh, <laughs> and he came up and uh, he took the microphone and he asked everybody to stand and they all joined hands and he led us in a chorus of Silent Night that night. And uh, he sang with the band many, many, many years, uh, many, many times. High hopes, Silent Night, whatever, if it was a holiday party. And uh, it wasn't until about five years ago that our friendship really deepened. I had helped his son Kane out with some of his, he's an incredible singer, Kane, and uh, helped him out with his, some of his vocalizing and his recording. And we started to share dinners and events together and to go out and become more social friends. I love being out with Harry. Uh, he would take a smoke break from the table at, at least a couple times during dinner. And even after I stopped smoking, I would follow him out. Because not only did I want to have a couple more minutes alone just to chat with him, but I'd love to walk behind him and watch people's faces as they saw him and noticed him. And he would give a wave and always a friendly gesture and always stop to say hello. And uh, he was a gentleman and a gentleman. He was always respectful, kind to people. And because of that, he was loved and is loved in a way that most broadcasters can only aspire to. He never said no to a request as you know, to record a phone message or to call and say hello to someone he knew would get a kick out of it. And his graciousness to the fans, his generosity with his time is a lesson, I think, for all of us. My favorite times involved spring training. I used to try to go down to spring training and coincide with Harry's birthday, which was the last week in, uh, in March. And the uh, first year I did that, Harry told me he wanted to spend his birthday at the dog track, which was a big surprise, right? And uh, Eileen and, uh, and Todd and, and, and uh, Kane, we were all at the dog track and we had a wonderful time. I had never been to the dogs before. We had dinner 
And Harry was kind of showing me the ropes, and I, I, I really took to it. And I was running around betting on dogs and horses and everything I could find. I bought him a ticket at random, and it won, and he got a big kick out of that. So I took to this whole thing, and then I found the poker room. And that's really where I wanted to be. So I said, you know, Harry, I went to play poker. And I ended up sitting there for about an hour, and the night ended, and Harry and his family came to say goodbye, and they walked by the poker table, and there were a bunch of Phillies fans at the table. Game stopped. Harry met everybody, talked to everybody, made everybody happy. The next morning, I woke up at my hotel, and it was a voicemail on my cell phone, and it said, uh, Eddie, Harry, there's a Gambler's Anonymous meeting at 12, I think you ought to get there. <laughs> I saved that message for a long time, I really wish I still had it. The afternoon of April 13th, I was having lunch in New York City uh, after appearing there the night before, and I got a text message that Harry had collapsed, and uh, I called Eileen immediately. And to my surprise, she answered the phone, and she quietly said, he's gone. And the world had changed forever, for me and for all of us. Uh, but as I reflected on his last year and his last days, his last full season ended with calling the World Championship against the team that his son worked for so they could work together. His last call was a walk-off home run, and his last moments were in the booth. So in a strange way, in that moment, I, I, I was happy for my friend, living the life he loved so much. It's such a gift. And I will always love baseball, and I'll forever be a Phillies fan until my last breath, but I can tell you this. It will never be the same around here. The rest of these back. Thank you very much. Very, very, very. Thank you so much for those kind comments and for helping us uh, think about Harry in a number of different ways. By the way, Eddie was recently on, uh, I'm turning the channel like I usually do. Up comes Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And there's Eddie. Uh, one of the contestants on the program, the TV show, and uh, he was going pretty good there for a while. I think he reached, what, the 50,000 mark or something? I did get, I didn't, I didn't get cash back. Yeah, he was, he, that, that was the next question. I think he wound up with about 25 grand. It's, it's not chunk change, it's okay. Something like that. Good day's work. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, that's, well, actually, that, that's less than you made in one night as a band leader, I'm sure. <laughs> At any rate, that, that, that's like getting was his time. <laughs> that uh, everyone knows, and uh, what Harry would do in addition to doing it on, on uh, radio and television uh, for the Phillies, he uh, at a party would give somebody the opportunity to hit a home run. And we have a, an excerpt from one of those many, many uh, usings of the phrase and the, the whole idea of out of here for one of our members here at the broadcast pioneers who's in the room today and he's going to have hit a home run in just a moment. All right, Tom Moran, the steps to the plate, and I gave the Phillies and the New York Yankees. Roger Clemens has the ball for the Yankees. Here's the 2-1 pitch to Moran. Swing it Thank you very much for coming today. 
Our next gentleman is a gentleman who directed and produced uh, stuff for the NFL films for many, many years. He basically worked for NFL films since 1976 and actually uh, was working with Harry Callis also for many, many years. He won several Emmy nominations with the program NFL Films and uh, the special highlights of the NFL. And the gentleman who worked with Harry and got award-winning productions with Harry as he was involved with the NFL, David Plow. David, please. Steve Sable, who <clears throat> sends his regrets. He is in Cincinnati, Ohio today, getting ready for the HBO show Hard Knocks. We're going to be with the Cincinnati Bengals uh, later this summer to do uh, their training camp. So he asked me if I would come in his place, and I said I absolutely would, but I never get tired of talking about my very good friend, Harry Callis. I sure miss Harry. Can you imagine the field day he would be having with Antonio Bastardo. <laughs> I don't know about you, but there are, there are times when I drive to work and I'll just turn off the radio and I'll just start doing Harry's voice because I just, I love it. I love to hear it. I've heard it. I've written for that voice. I've listened to it and entertained. Uh, it's a voice that's so unique and yet it's so much in every man's voice. Uh, I was privileged to work with Harry for 32 years. I started here in 1976. I got here and two weeks later it was Legionnaire's disease, so I was a little worried that maybe I had brought something to Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. But I really enjoyed my time here to become Philadelphian, and working with Harry certainly uh, is part of that. Uh, Harry, uh, to all of us, is known because of his baseball analysis, but he also lived in a parallel universe. To everyone outside of Philadelphia, Harry was uh, the voice of the National Football League and of NFL films, and many people who were never, never lived here or never heard Philly's uh, broadcasts, like Shane Victorino, knew Harry from the, the work that he did for NFL films. And it was a pleasure to write for him because Many times we would have to write under deadline, and a lot of the writing that we did really wasn't very good because we were sleep deprived or under the gun. But Harry would always take what we had written, good or bad, and he would make it sound great. And I was always appreciative of that because some of the work that I did, the, the scripts uh, weren't very good, but uh, he always made them sing. Another thing about Harry was that Everyone has, uh, knows what a great guy he was, and he did favors for me, as I'm sure he did for everyone else in this room. But Harry was a really smart, well-educated, and just had a great command and facility for the English language. Good testament to his University of Iowa education, I guess, because he would come into the booth, read over the scripts before he would do the, the voiceover work, and he would sometimes, very tactfully, but gently, make a correction if there was a grammatical mistake. He would, I think you're slitting an infinitive here, or don't you mean this? But he would do it in such a nice way that, that the producer who had written the bad copy would, would uh, feel like, oh, Harry saved my bacon once again. But he was uh, very good about, it was important to him to make sure that it was the best work that it could possibly be. He was a consummate professional in every sense of the word. And another thing that Harry was great at was because of this time he had spent in Hawaii, when we would have these American Samoan players, whereas other announcers who would come in to do the work would stumble over them, he would get the guy's name on the first take. Oh, this is Pia Sainabola Telly. It just went, it would just rattle right off his tongue. No problem with those uh, Polynesian names. So that's uh, part of Harry's experience that, that served him well. Uh, I guess I have something in common with uh, Max Sarris, in addition to both of us uh, being somewhat corpulent, Max Sarris uh, was the batter who hit the home run on Harry's last home run call. Uh, I was fortunate, in a way, to be the Max Sarris of NFL films. The last film that Harry ever narrated in NFL films was a production that I did on the Arizona Cardinals 2008 Super Bowl season. 
And uh, this was in the middle of March, and it was after he had his surgery. He was heading down to Clearwater to finish up spring training. And at the end of the uh, session, I said, Harry, I just wanted to let you know we've been working together now for over 30 years. I've enjoyed every minute of it, and uh, just so happy that uh, I've had the opportunity to work with you. And hardly a day goes by that I don't think of that moment. Just so glad that I was able to articulate that to him. But I think he knew that anyway because he knew how everyone felt about him. Uh, just a great person, a great professional. Uh, uh, we will uh, miss him, and thank you very much. Thank you, David Cloud. David introduced to me a producer, director for NFL Films, and as we said, uh, having done work with Harry House and Inside the NFL, uh, he is also a great author with several books about the wit and wisdom of the world of sports. David Plott, let's give him another hand. <laughs> Our next guest is not in the room, but is with us in spirit and probably is the person who knew Harry the best. Uh, you don't get any closer to an individual uh, as far as being a part of that individual in so many ways, being an offspring from his loins, following in his footsteps, doing the same thing that his dad did. He's in his 12th season right now, down in Florida as a sports broadcaster. You had the privilege and pleasure to watch him and hear him do the games with his dad, which had to be a kick for him, for Harry and for Todd. And we have him on the telephone right now. First of all, welcome, Todd. Todd Callis. Todd, thank you for being with me. Hello? Hello, Todd? Yeah, how are you all doing? Thank you very much. Thank you for being with us today. You have a lot of people in this room. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You have a lot of people in this room who love your dad. And that's one of the reasons they're here today. But then again, everybody in the Delaware Valley loved your dad, loved his work. And whether the Phillies were winning or losing, he made the game interesting and exciting. Congratulations on having a fine dad. We'd like to have some of your thoughts about Pop. Well, it was just an amazing, amazing life that he had. He was doing what he wanted to do, the age of 10, the rest of his life, until the day he passed away when he was riding a lineup down getting ready for a Phillies national game. How many people can do exactly what they want to do in life and have no regrets, but Dad was incredibly at peace at the end of his life. Because not only was he doing what he wanted to do, but he was surrounded by an incredible support group of family, of friends, and of this amazing Philadelphia fans who became part of his epidemic and his love. When did it come to you that you wanted to be in the same business your dad was in? Was it at Syracuse University or even earlier than that? It was something that a lot of people always thought I was going to get into because as a kid, I would keep my own scorebook, I would keep my own stats, and then on the afternoons, I would help out the broadcast booth with the Irish scoreboard. There were a number of people that always thought, well, this is going to be what Todd's going to do. He's just going to follow his dad's footsteps. And I wasn't entirely certain. I went to the University of Maryland and was an undecided major, switched a few times, but then I did train for a Syracuse the thought that I was going to be challenged at the best kids in the country in broadcasting and I would see where I was in relation to them. And, uh, went there with a dual degree and at that point figured out that I might have a future in this business and gave it a shot. I've been lucky enough to stay in it to this day. That's, that's very good. Listen, there's somebody in the room that you want to give a shout out to. We have your mom, Eileen, and of course uh, Kiki, your stepsister. You want to give a shout out to them? Yeah, I haven't talked to them in a little while, so I hope everybody's doing well. I'm glad they're there as a part of the whole uh, festivity. Well, the last year you had the pleasure of getting involved in the World Series. You are calling the game for uh, uh, Tampa, and uh, your dad's calling it for the Phillies. Uh, and you also got a chance to get together there as well. Some thoughts back to that day. Well, that was it. the most special of times for the Rays and the Phillies to be a part of the World Series together. And there wasn't one moment that we thought anything different. And this was the most incredible moment of our careers because it was the pinnacle for both teams, 
to reach the World Series and for us to be able to share it together. We actually got to call the fourth inning of the first team of the World Series, the Tropicana Field, together on the Philly Radio Network. So it was one of those years that was magical in many ways. And for that to be the final year for that, uh, for him to go out on top with his beloved Phillies, uh, getting to call that last out and getting to share the World Series together with him was all uh, overwhelming to look back on how special that was. That had to be a great pleasure for you and for your dad. Can you give us an insight of something that occurred in your life aside from the broadcasting activity that uh, you and your dad shared together that our people here might like to hear? We just always like to share a uh, little jazz back and forth together, it was, uh, especially once I moved down to Florida and worked for the Tampa Bay Rays. Uh, but it was always, that had a, a very playful side, like a, uh, he was always kind of a rascal where he liked these people. So he, that was one we always went back and forth on it. The Phillies had lost more games in the regular season for the Rays than whenever they played the Manly Baseball. I had bragging rights for a while that they certainly had to the World Series that game. But we shared a lot of great times together. Um, spring training was a little special growing up because we were together as a family for the entire month. And uh, we just always, you know, talked on Sundays during the regular season. That seemed to be our thing because of the travel. Uh, it was always the one day it seemed like we could all catch up. So uh, it is definitely different this summer not having those Sundays uh, to catch up. I'm sure this Sunday in particular, the Father's Day will be, will be pretty difficult. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. Listen, uh, your dad, uh, in addition to uh, the Phillies and the baseball activity and the NFL films, he had a knack for singing. Uh, do you follow in that footstep? No, no. I think all the singing teams have gone to the game. I know they need to have high hopes, kind of a song, uh, whenever the occasion warranted. What's that? I, I thought maybe you had a high hopes, kind of a song, that your dad did for many, many years, like you did now yourself. Uh, no, I don't have a go-to song. I try to avoid karaoke as much as possible. But, uh, yeah, and you sing. Little, you sing all the shout. I'm a little singer, and uh, Kate has fallen into the footsteps. Well, you're probably that I was definitely more the uh, gregarious uh, guy who would go to the piano bar, so I sing in the theater. <laughs> I guess you sing only in the shower and not uh, in public like that. Listen, Todd, we want to thank you so very much for taking time out. want to wish you the best of luck this year with the Rays, and uh, thank you so much for joining us today in uh, memory of your dad. All right, thank you very much to all those involved in the broadcast. Our next guest worked with Harry for many, many years. Matter of fact, he was the PA announcer for the Philadelphia Phillies since 1972. So they worked side by side, one booth next to the next for the most part, and has been a, a colleague of Harry Cowles for so many years uh, at the Phillies ballpark, also with the Philadelphia Sports Writers Association, because Harry was our MC, our guest MC, every year for many, many years. Uh, at our banquet at the Philadelphia Sports Writers Banquet. Our next guest also uh, shared uh, doing so much in the world of sports. He was play-by-play -play announcer for Temple football, for Penn football, for Big Five basketball, and now does Drexel basketball. As a matter of fact, he and I did Penn and Temple football for many, many years together. Also, we did Big Five basketball together. He was the play-by-play, -play, I was the color. And we just have had a great, enjoyable time in that respect and also as a personal friend. Uh, anyway, he worked with Harry for over 37 years, and he's also the PA announcer for the Philadelphia Eagles. So whenever there's sports happening, there's Dan Baker. That's one of for sharing Harry with us for so many, many years. Um, I grew up in Philadelphia in the 1950s, a big sports fan, and this city has a wonderful legacy of outstanding broadcasters. Uh, listening to My Song and Gene Kelly in the 1950s, as I know many of you did, 
and the great Bill Campbell, yes. one of the greatest play-by-play -play announcers in the history. Yes. For so many years, and uh, as mentioned, Harry started uh, with the Phillies in 1971. I started in 1972, and um, he just did such a great job from the beginning. That wonderful, wonderful voice. And like other talented announcers in this room, like Andy Muster, I, I always thought Andy uh, prepared better than any sports broadcaster I knew. Phillies radio broadcast and telecast for so many, many years. Uh, David talked about the parallel universe and uh, that Harry uh, was a voice of NFL films in addition to the Phillies. Well, another thing that's near and dear to my heart is Big Five basketball. And Harry was a wonderful play-by-play -play voice for the Big Five. In fact, when I think of the Big Five, and I've done a few games myself over the years on radio and television for Big Five basketball, but the, we had three great names I always felt as play-by-play -play broadcasters in the Big Five. Les Kiter and Big Al, Al Meltzer. And yes, Harry Callis, also an outstanding basketball play-by-play -play announcer. Besides Big Five, of course, Harry also did Notre Dame football and basketball, and a brilliant job he did. One of the things that made Harry so good on the air, besides the preparation and the outstanding talent, he had what all of the great play-by-play -play announcers possess, and that's anticipation. When there was a fly ball into the outfield, you knew at once from the tenor of Harry's voice whether that ball had a chance to be a home run, whether it was going to the warning track, whether there was a chance the ball could be caught, whether it was going to drop uh, in shallow outfield. The, the great anticipation skills and seeing the people rise at their seats he was just so very good at that. I think we all kind of know it. it's sometimes difficult to put into words. You hear it. It's difficult to assess what it actually is that these great play-by-play -play announcers are doing. But I think anticipation was one of them. One of the things that, that I had the great privilege to share with Harry was serving as an on-field host for the Phillies. Again, Harry started 1971 and myself in 1972 and uh, because the Phillies had such an ambitious promotions department we do many events on the field prior to Phillies games in fact I do the starting lineups on the field before most games and uh, as a consequence it's difficult for me to get back to the booth to ask the first or second batter and that's where uh, broadcast uh, pioneers member Dave Abramson comes in. Here's the voice. Dave, stand up a minute. Yeah. But um, when we had really special events, the big guy came out, Harry Callis. And for our wall of fame and, and, and certain special on-field presentations, it was a great privilege to introduce the wonderful voice of Harry Callis. And one of my professional highlights was in the brilliantly orchestrated closing ceremonies of Veterans Stadium. Uh, so well done, put together by Larry Schenk, Philly's Vice President of Public Relations. And uh, for those of you who witnessed it in person or who saw it on television, you might recall all the former Phillies that came back and uh, Todd McGraw and Mike Schmidt and Steve Carlton. And then as, uh, the, as the players entered the field, uh, their names were displayed on the scoreboard. There was no announcement. And then Harry and I took turns announcing each of these former Phillies greats as they stepped on home plate and exited the field. And uh, I have a couple of grainy pictures of Harry and me doing that, but it was a very proud moment to be associated with Hall of Fame broadcaster Harry Callis.
It was also mentioned by Eddie and several other of our wonderful guests of what a gracious, gracious man Harry is. And uh, probably many people in this room have received holiday cards personally written by Harry. He took the time to write a little note on every one of his cards. And if you would ever show Harry the slightest kindness, I guess this is kind of a lost art anymore, but he would take the time uh, to write a thank you note to everybody who did even the slightest favor for Harry. Uh, another part of his graciousness. There was nobody too important. There was nobody that wasn't important enough for Harry to say hello to. He always took the time to sign autographs, to take pictures. He was a wonderful presence for so many years, and we were so fortunate to have Harry Callis in our lives. I'd like to thank you, at Broadcast Pioneers, and Pat Delcy for allowing me to speak about my good friend. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much. Dan Baker. He and I are um, active in this industry for many, many years. In fact, one of the highlights that we both shared, which is kind of unusual, is that we did a game in Tokyo, Japan, together. And uh, Temple University was going to be playing Boston College, but they planned the game to be played in Tokyo. And we traveled. Uh, somebody had to go there, so he and I went. And uh, courtesy of the Mitsubishi people who were sponsoring the Mirage Bowl there, they were trying to get football in Tokyo activated because it wasn't a sport that was of a Japanese nature. So we had the pleasure of doing that along with so many other games in the Big Five as well as uh, football with the Temple and Penn. Dan Baker, a great sport person. <laughs> Our next guest is someone who's had the pleasure of being on both sides of the street, if you will. He had a tremendous career in Philadelphia television. Came to Philadelphia back in, uh, well, back in 91, I mean 1981. He came to Philly as a news and sports anchor for 6ABC and was there for many, many years covering the World Series, covering all the sporting events in Philadelphia. And uh, of course he retired. He died and decided to retire in 2001. But retirement didn't last long because he missed the action, so he got right back on the horse, if you will, except on the other side of the stream. He became the public affairs director for the Philadelphia Phillies. And that's what he is right now. So he was uh, doing sports, covering the sport people. And now he's at the sports organization talking about the team to the media. Let's welcome Scott Palmer, one of our fellow <laughs> Scott, thank you very much. I'd like to uh, thank Pat and Jerry for inviting me. And I see another friendly face. It's so great to see all of my former colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, Carter Murbrier, Captain Noah. Yeah. I know the, uh, the lunch is uh, going on a little bit, and I'll keep my remarks short because I, I know that uh, just a couple months from now I'll turn 60 years old, and I know that... Uh, that's very nice to say it all. <laughs> I don't believe it. But I, I know that at my age, if we go much longer, we're all going to be late for the early bird dinner. So <laughs> where I'm going. Now, the first time I met Harry, it was in 1981, I had just come to Philadelphia, and uh, big baseball fan, loved Major League Baseball, loved reporting on, on the Phillies for Action News, and darn it, there wasn't a baseball strike. So we had nothing for a couple of months, and our station was desperate for anything having to do with the Phillies, but all the players had left town because there was no sign that the strike was going to be over anytime soon. So I had this great idea of what's, what's Harry Callis doing? I knew he was staying home, so I called Harry, and he was most gracious. I said, Harry, I need a story. I need it today. What are you doing? <laughs> I'm sealing my driveway. <laughs> so I said, do you mind if I come over with a camera? <laughs> do a story on you sealing your driveway. Why well, would you want to have a story on me sealing my driveway? But he was most gracious. He did a little play-by-play. -play. Uh, it, was, it was very nice, and he helped me out. And from that moment on, I knew I had a friend in Harry Callis, and I was, uh, 
I was just like every other person in the Delaware Valley and people all over the world, as we know Harry's work with kind of tell films, who had a had a friend in Harry. Uh, he just had a remarkable way, not only of being a professional broadcaster, being a Hall of Fame broadcaster, but doing acts of kindness. Uh, we, we've been talking about some of those uh, acts of kindness as, as we've gone on here, but uh, I can tell you a story about Harry's Christmas calling, which was every year spending the week before Christmas on a day with the fine elderly folks at Fair Acres. Harry uh, would sing Christmas carols to them. Uh, but uh, the last year he came with our friend John Brazier, our director of Fun and Games, and told John, I'll, I'll be happy to sing any song, but I really think the song should be carols uh, of a Christian nature, and I'd really rather not do jingle bells. <laughs> so, of course, after uh, he sang a few, somebody Harry, sing Jingle Bells! <laughs> sing Jingle Bells! We look at Brazier like this and went, Jingle Bells, Jingle It was the whole thing. He was not going to you know, let a request go unanswered, but that's the kind of guy he was. Harry had a wonderful warm spot in his heart for the men and women of our country, the brave young people who wear our uniform and our fighting men and women. And he would always, always, without fail, give time to the soldiers and sailors uh, in, in our country. Uh, he was just wonderful. And Rob Brooks, our, our director of broadcasting, knows that uh, whenever we put Harry in a position where he had to go to the ballpark, if he was going to appear on behind the pinstripes in our studio, we had to allow an extra 15 minutes because that's how long it would take him to get through the crowd because Harry would not go by any fan who wanted an autograph and he would meticulously sign the autograph Harry Callis Hall of Fame. He had a special relationship with the players unlike any other broadcaster. Uh, team broadcasters are pretty close to the folks who play the game, but nobody was as close as Harry. One of the most honored traditions that you can give broadcasters is to allow them to sit in the back of the airplane. That's where the players sit. Harry Callis sat in the back of the airplane. Nobody else could do that. Players loved Harry. They said it really wasn't a home run until they got back in the video room and heard Harry call their name. Then they knew they did a home run. In 93, after they beat the Braves in the National League Championship Series, a bunch of guys, most of the team was in the training room, and they said there's something missing. There's just something missing. We, we're not complete yet. Somebody get Harry. When Harry came in and sang high hopes, then they knew they had won the National League Championship Series and they were going to the World Series. Players he would give nicknames to, like Mitch Williams, Mitchie Poop. <laughs> Mitch hated that name. He said the only person he allowed to call him Mitchie Poop was Harry. From now on forever, Chase Hudley will be the man. Because Harry said he would be the man and was the man. He was just so special. Glenn Wilson named his son after Harry, former Phillies outfielder. His wife didn't like the name Harry, by the way, so the middle name of the child was Callis. That worked out just fine. <laughs> of all the things that Harry loved to do, maybe more than anything else, he loved telling a good story. And I like to share our, I think my, one of my favorites, because Harry had so many great stories that he told. You may have heard a lot of these, but chances are you haven't heard this one. Harry would tell it about the public address announcer at Madison Square Garden. And Dan Baker would enjoy this. I'm sure he's heard it many times, being a PA announcer. But the unflappable nature of a public affair, a public address announcer. Oh yes, I think I'm Steve. Well, let's put it this way. This is a difficult story to tell in this company, but I'll do my best. The public address announcer at the beginning of the game said, ladies and gentlemen, will you all now please stand as Gladys Gooding sings our national anthem. Well, right out of the blue in a couple seats in front of the press box, a gentleman stood up very loudly and said, Gladys Gooding, how should I say this, has something in common with a Hoover vacuum cleaner. <laughs> and as Harry said it, best public address announcer, unflinching, said, nevertheless, Gladys Gooding will say our national anthem.
have no idea what they want to do in life until they're sophomore, sometimes they're junior or senior in college, even though they have declared as a sophomore. Well, I think this next young man uh, had a definite idea what he wanted to be. As a matter of fact, he was raised, born and raised in Harrisburg, but uh, in 1956, he won the Junior Sportscaster Award and wound up doing several innings of Phillies baseball with Bai Song and Gene Kelly. What a thrill that had to be for a young man like that. Well, he not only knew he wanted to be in broadcasting, went toward that and became, of course, a broadcaster. Went, well, he also went to Syracuse University and he worked in uh, California before coming back to Philadelphia to pick up on his career. Now we're talking about a guy who did the Eagles, 65 to 71, the Sixers also that same time period, and Villanova College games as well. He worked for CBS Television in 71, covering the World Series and the Super Bowl and the Masters. And then he went on to become, this is ironic, to become a Phillies broadcaster. And the person he replaced, who had retired, was by son. Talk about life having a, a twist and a turn, ladies and gentlemen. Andy Buster. Many of you have made reference to the kindness of Harry and what kind of a guy he was. I'd just like to re reaffirm that because I worked next to him side by side with. Harry and Richie Ashburn for 26 years in the booth, and I'm very proud to say we never ever had a crossword. And a lot of that goes to Harry because he told me a story when he was a young broadcaster coming up with the Astros. He broke in with two veteran broadcasters who never really included Harry. They kind of excluded him and made him feel sunk. And he didn't appreciate that. And he formed in his own mind the idea that if he ever became the number one guy, he would make sure there was harmony in the booth. And for 26 years that I was there, we had harmony. Never met a man who loved his job as much as he did. He just absolutely adored what he was doing and couldn't picture himself doing anything else, so much so that I had him out of Bryn Mawr Presbyterian one day speaking to our men's group. We had a quiet moment before it began, and I asked Harry, I said, when are you going to retire? He got that blank look on his face, he said, well, what would I do? <laughs> it was then that I knew that Harry was going to leave this earth much the way he did. As a fellow broadcaster attending next to him, I want to just mention that there was one thing he did that was better than any other announcer I ever heard, and that was call the play from start to finish, accurately, beginning on time, end on time. He was the easiest guy in the world to make up a highlight show with because he always had it boom, boom, boom. Many people have called Vince Scully the greatest baseball announcer, and that's argument, and that, you, you can argue that point if you want to, but Harry was the best at calling players. Now, just to, to finish with uh, a story or two, you know, Harry loved to tell stories, but there are a few about him as well. And uh, where this is staying well, I'll make him with a some more. <laughs> but uh, the story goes that uh, Harry was uh, sitting around the bar in the hotel after a game, as he often did, and uh, had a few drinks. And the subject came up of television directors. Those of you who worked at Channel 17 will remember Steve Silverman. He was our director when I joined the team. He was a very good television director, but he was a horse's petunia of a guy. <laughs> <laughs> and he was tough to be around. He would complain about everything, and every day he was sick. And he was the kind of guy that would take an airplane meal and send it back. He said, what are you <laughs> great baseball directors, and Harry all of a sudden has heard to say, 
Steve Silverman is the greatest director in the history of baseball television. One of the other guys who was there hadn't had quite as much to drink and he decided to challenge Harry. <laughs> he says, Harry, how do you know that? Because he told me. <laughs> the uh, sports writers banquet on a winter Monday night, as you know. Sometimes the Phillies caravan would leave the very next day, and he was always the MC on that as they went out to the hinterlands and spread the good word and told them how good we'd be next year, whether we would or not. <laughs> and uh, they always left early in the morning because they probably had a lunch to do up in Allentown or somewhere. So Harry went to all these various parties, and everybody had one after these in the hotel when he took suites and had parties. And he went to all of them. Finally gets back to his room and he picks up the phone and calls the uh, front desk. He says, this is Harry Counts. I'd like to leave a wake-up call for 6.30. Yeah. <coughs> and the outfit said, well, fine, Mr. Callis, we'll be glad to do that. Are you aware of the fact that it's 6 o'clock right now? <laughs> Especially, and I, I actually got my dad to come out to the 
bar too, and that was very hard to do. Dad did not drink, and I think I had two beers in my life with him. One was at a wedding, and one was at Lefty Abdul. Um, well, anyway, it was uh, early 90s, and uh, the World Cup soccer was going on, and, uh, and there was all these soccer players in the bar, and it was getting heated. There were guys from Russia, Britain, uh, Britain and Ireland, Spain, and, 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 and you know these soccer players can be pretty nasty. Well, they, especially after a few beers, they were all you know, getting pretty hot and heavy. Uh, and it was getting kind of noisy in there. Well, Harry just kind of, I guess after seeing what was going on, he, he kind of just stood up and he said, I'll, I'll handle this. And he gets up and he goes to the piano and he just starts singing. He's, and I don't even know whose anthem it was. It was one of them, like Russian, I don't know how we do it. <laughs> he, he start, and then you know, those guys came over, and they, arm in arm, they started again. You know, and then the Spanish guys came over. And by the time he was done, about an hour later, the whole place was just, you know, with Harry. It was, it was really amazing to see what he could do. He just diffused the whole situation. The, the, the whole soccer world there became one, and it was because of Harry. Just watching him do that was unbelievable. So that's why I wanted to share with you. Um, the other one was, this one's a little on the strange side, but uh, Harry loved the dog track. And the very first time I ever went to a dog track with Harry uh, was 1987. Uh, it was April 1st, and I remember the date because my sister Jan was killed in a car accident that, that night. And I, unbeknownst to us, obviously, we were at the track, and I, I had no idea um, how to bet on dogs or anything. I'd never been to a dog track. Uh, my wife Lisa was with me and she didn't know either, but um, Harry said he'd help us along. There were 13 races and I guess after 12 races losing, I never, I didn't win one race and I just kept thanking Harry for that. <laughs> um, I finally said, look, I got like 10 bucks in my pocket. I'm going to bet on a long shot dog. And he's like, Richard, you might as well throw that money in the bay. You know? And I was like, well, I got to do it. So I, I bet on the dog. The dog won by about 15 lengths. <laughs> and and I, I, I got all my money back plus more. And Harry was happier for me than he, you wouldn't believe how happy he was. We, we drove home. And um, I, when I walked in, my dad and my brother were crying. They just received the news about Jam. And Harry was there for us and stayed with us all night. And we, we flew home. And, uh, my dad and I went to the hospital to uh, identify Jan, and I just happened to notice the, the doctor's chart and everything, and kind of stuck in my brain. Well, about six months later, I was going through my wallet, and I pulled out the ticket that I had from that night, and, and it was about 1118 was written on the ticket for the winning ticket, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. Jan died at 1118, and it just and I told Harry the story later because it, it was something. And he, he said, he, he said, I knew it. Your sister had something to do with that dog winning. And it, was, it was the same. And he, he got the same kind of chill that I got when I when I saw all this. And uh, but he was always there for us. He called me again later uh, after Dad had passed away. Every year he'd go to the dog track on Dad's birthday, which was March 19th. And he'd call me. And one year he called me. He's like, Your dad's still with us. Um, I just bet on Husker Wendy. The dog won by 20 lengths. You know, he, Dad had a big uh, Nebraska Cornhusker following, and Harry always kind of respected that. Yeah. They tease each other quite a bit. But um, to me, Harry, you know, I got to grow up with Andy Musser and Dad and Harry. And I literally spent a lot of time, and Andy can tell you, I was in that booth a lot, you know, doing good and bad things, I'm sure. Um, but I, could, I couldn't have had a better life growing up with those three guys to, to watch do ball games. Um, but I, sometimes I was there for every home game. Uh, I'm sure I was a pest, but I loved baseball like they did. And to watch Harry and Dad and, and Andy do games like that was uh, very special. My family and, and Harry's family have always been close. And, um, you know, I want to thank Eileen for you know, everything she's done for us over here. She loved my father. I know when Harry and uh, Eileen got married, Dad was the only one there with them. And um, I think he told you, Eileen, that you still had a chance to run? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a pleasure. I really appreciate being here. I do have one more thing I want to do. Uh, my wife, Lisa, uh, the day I went down, the day they had the memorial for Harry, I had no idea I was going to do this. 
I saw Dan Baker, and my wife had written a poem about Harry. Harry's big in poems. He wrote one when Jan died, he wrote one when my father died, uh, and gave them to us, and they were very special. Well, I came home one the night before the memorial, and Lisa had written this poem, and I showed it to Dan, and he did the appropriate thing. I guess I said, I'll either read it at the funeral, or I'll read it at the ballpark, and he, he told me, you're going to read it at the ballpark, and uh, we'll pitch in. So I was sitting in the stands, and the next time I know, he called me up first to read the <laughs> The poem. But here it is, I just wanted to read it. I, I, it's been very special to me because Lisa wrote it. It's also special because of Harry. I don't think I need glasses for this. His voice would melt butter. There could be no other. To replace our Harry the K. He was a kind man, would engage any fan, and never turn someone away. He had a great smile and plenty of style. I hopes was his motto and song. When he'd shout, out of here, we'd all stand and cheer to know that the ball was long gone. With his partner and friend, he's reunited again, and they'll call all the plays from above. Though our voice is now gone, to grace heaven with your song, Harry, know that you go with our love.